Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Welcome. I think 140 people got tonight. That's a fantastic, fantastic turnout. Um, I'm Donna Cox from the Moore Meadows Group, and um, thank you for coming tonight. And I'm not very good at doing public speaking, I have to say, so I've got some notes, so I might have to refer to them, but thank you for coming tonight to hear Kathy Horsley from the Bumblebee Conservation Trust. She's here tonight to talk about bees, bumblebees in particular, and what we can do to help with their conservation. Before I hand over to Kathy, I'd just like to say a few words about the Moor Meadows Group, for those of you who may not be familiar with it. In 2015, a, um, a community initiative was formed by a small number of local people whose aim was to support Dartmoor Meadows. The group um, was started to conserve, restore and help to um, create and manage new meadows within the landscape of the Dartmoor National Park. An email meadows exchange was set up which has, currently has 80 active members, plus a series of meadow open days. Some meadow owners have um, an established wildflower meadows, while others have got a pasture that they'd like to convert, yet others have just got a wildflower patch in their garden. Apart from putting in a pond, a wildflower meadow is one of the best things you can provide to support wildlife. Insects feed on the flowers, and insect-eating birds, such as house martins, swifts and swallows, they feed on the insects. And it's their main food source, actually, the insects in the meadow. For those of you who are interested in creating a meadow, I'm pleased to announce um, that the Moor Meadows Group are organising an event especially for you, um, a Meadow Makers Conference, which is part of the Dartmoor Meadows Festival, which is taking place on the 1st of July at Brimps Farm on Dartmoor. There'll be talks, practical talks, about meadow creation and management, and that's on for every scale of garden, or if you want to create several acres on your land, it's going to cover all. And there are talks about the life to be found in the meadow, on the birds, the bees and the butterflies that depend upon them. Um, let me just check my notes, sorry. <laughs> So further information, you've all found a leaflet on your chair. Um, there's information on your chair about, um, if you're interested in that event, about how to book. Um, and finally, I'd just like to explain a bit about the title um, of tonight's talk. The talk set Kathy helped turn Dartmoor into a bee nature reserve. That's a, a big ask, isn't it? And what, and what does it mean? It's not just about Dartmoor Upland Moor, it's about the whole of the National Park. And why not? Everybody here tonight knows that bees are in trouble. Many are in decline and some have become extinct. But there is good news, because we as individuals can do something on our own patch. We can do something on our own patch. Every patch of wildflower-rich habitat bridges the gap between the larger meadow sites. So every orchard, garden, whether it's the size of a tablecloth, every allotment, roadside verge and churchyard are all potential link sites. So every bit of meadow, no matter what the scale, can help bring nature back. Thank you. I'll hand you over to Cathy, who will talk about the practicalities. Good evening, Good evening everybody. Um, thanks, Donna, for that introduction. 
Um, so I'd like to talk to you this evening about how we're going to do this. How are we going to achieve turning Dartmoor into a nature reserve? So first of all, um, I come from Wolby Conservation Trust, and in case you've not come across us before, oh, is that a bit better? Yes. Okay, sorry. <laughs> you haven't missed anything. Um, <laughs> so, um, if you've not come across the Bumblebee Conservation Trust before, we're a small independent charity. I'm going to step a bit closer to my screen, actually, I can't see. Um, and we're working hard to raise awareness of the plight of the Bumblebee, to apply research and to inform land management of what we should all be trying to do to try and halt and reverse these declines. And I'm pleased to say we've now got over 10,000 members, but we still need more, so if you're interested in joining us, that would be fantastic. We've got 22 members of staff, one of which in the southwest, me, so I cover <coughs> quite a large area, Cornwall, Devon, Somerset and Wiltshire. Um, so we're quite a small organisation, as you can tell. Um, so, let's talk about UK bees. So we've got about 270 species of bee. Quite often people think that there's just one kind of bee, but that's not the case. We've actually got a huge variety in the UK. So 24 of those are bumblebees, and one of those is the honeybee. So up here is um, that's the, uh, an example of a bumblebee, and underneath is the honeybee. So you can see that there are some anatomical differences once you get up close and personal. So the rest are solitary bees. So what do I mean by solitary bees? I don't mean they're quite lonely. Sounds like it, doesn't it? But what I mean by that is unlike the bumblebee, which has got a colony wherein there's a queen who um, lays all the eggs and the workers do all the work, and they work as a, a big organisation, solitary bees don't uh, work in that way. So there's just the male and the female. There's not this um, social um, life, life cycle. So what they all have in common is that they all feed on nectar for energy and pollen for protein. So they're all vegetarians. And they come with a pollen collecting apparatus. So here on the, the bottom here, um, that's a bumblebee hind leg. And this shiny patch here is the pollen basket. And that's where she packs all the pollen on to carry that back to her nest. Solitary bees don't have that. I should say the honeybee has got a pollen basket like that as well. And you can see here, she's been very busy. There's a really big ball of pollen on her pollen basket there. Um, solitary bees have got really long hairs um, to collect the pollen. So they don't have this shiny patch, but they've got a hairy leg. So this is an example of an extremely hairy legged bee. Um, almost looks like she's got baggy trousers on there. She's got a lot of hair to collect that pollen and carry it back to her nest. So this is really just to give you a flavour of the diversity of bees that we've got in the UK. These are all solitary bees. Um, this one here is a rather special bee. It's quite a common bee in, in many gardens, actually, so you may be lucky enough to have this one, the Walcarda bee. And what she's doing there is she's scraping off the leaf hairs, and she's going to use those to line her nest, make it all nice and cosy and comfortable. And um, this one, the red mason bee, this is a really important pollinator of many of our fruit crops. And this, is, again, is another common species that you find in your garden. And this fancy chap here, with his long antennae, um, this is a longhorned bee, no prizes for why, it's called that. Um, so you can see there's a really big range of species that we've got in the UK. Um, and this is just to say there's a new field guide out, so if you're interested in finding out a bit more, um, then this is out now, and then it talks you through how to identify all the bees that we've got in the UK. So on to bumblebees. So what are bumblebees? Well, they belong to the order of insects Hymenoptera, and that includes bees, wasps, ants, and sawflies. They're all related to each other. And bumblebees belong to the genus Bombus, which is quite a special sounding name, I think. There are about 250 species around the world, and this map here shows you the distribution of them. So wherever you've got the red dots, that's where you've got the most species, and the blue dots are where you've got fewer. So you can see that they're Predominantly in the Northern Hemisphere, for example, you don't get any in Australia, and they're cold adapted. So they've got these nice furry coats on, and they can generate their own heat, which means that they're fantastic pollinators, particularly in our climate, where we know what our summers are like, where they can fly in the cold and the rain, whereas many other insects, which um, warm up from the sun, they can't fly in the conditions that bumblebees can. So this diagram here um, shows you the temperature of bumblebee that's flying. So I'll just talk you through here, you can see, oops. Um, this hot spot here 
and um, that's its thorax, and here are its wings. I don't know if you can make that out in its legs here. This hotspot here is about 35 degrees, um, so you can see that that's quite special, really, for an insect to be able to generate that amount of heat. And the way they do this is they shiver, so they um, vibrate their muscles and generate heat that way. So with these high energy requirements, they need a lot of flowers. So we've got 24 species of bumblebee in the UK, plus one being reintroduced that had gone extinct. I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. So this diagram here just shows you, um, just to give you a sense of the diversity, really. And we identify them largely on the colour pattern. So um, if anyone's interested in learning a bit more, there's lots of ID guides out, um, not, um, not least our one at the back, £2.50, a bargain, I'm sure you'll agree. Um, so they're quite a nice group to get into. Um, and if any of you are birders or into butterflies, there's not that much difference in terms of the skill sets that you need to be able to get into bumblebees. So interestingly, six of our bumblebee species are cuckoos. So like the cuckoo bird, the cuckoo bumblebee will steal someone else's nest. So this is an example of a cuckoo bumblebee here. Oops, keep doing that. <laughs> um, here. And um, what they do is they wait for the normal bumblebee to make her nest and build up some workers and provision it with lots of food. And then she'll go in and fight the queen and either kill her or suppress her. And then she'll lay her own eggs and get the existing workers to forage and feed her offspring. And quite often they're similarly coloured to the host that they are taking over the nest of. Um, but they have a really thick armour plating, because if you imagine going into a bumblebee nest, that's not really advisable. And there's lots of stinging going on, so you want to be um, protected from that. So lots of the cuckoos have got a kind of shiny look to them. You might be able to see that in that picture there. So I just wanted to mention this special bumblebee, the Bilbury bumblebee, a uh, Dartmoor speciality. So this one is found on uplands, so um, all across the UK. But um, on Dartmoor, we really don't have a clear picture of where this bee is. So if you can get out and about and you see something looking like this, we really want to hear about it. So the Bilbury bumblebee is quite a smart bee. I have to say it is my favourite bumblebee. It's got this beautiful tail, um, this lovely orangey red tail, this... Um, Screen doesn't do it justice. On my picture, on my laptop, it looks a lot better. Um, so you can see. <laughs> so compared to these other two species that look very similar, this is the red tail. It's got quite a small red tail here. You can see some black here, whereas on this one, it's a very long red tail. And this one, the early bumblebee, has got a very little orangey tail as well. So it's quite different in that respect. It does take a bit of getting used to to pick out what features you need to see. Um, but it's well worth trying to get your eye in, and we really do want to know about this bee. So, um, I don't know if any of you are into recording wildlife already, but there are a number of ways you can submit your records, but iRecord is one or iSpot you might want to think about. So, the um, Bilbury bumblebee is hardly in decline. It's, um, like its name suggests, it's associated with Bilbury, but it also uses a wide range of other plants as well. So um, as well as foraging around on um, the moorland itself, it also uses gardens, woodlands, all sorts of habitats. So this bee could pop up anywhere, so keep a look out. So sadly, seven of our UK bumblebees are UK BAP or Section 41 species. So what that means is they're considered to be at such risk that they're under um, conservation um, aims. And nine species are in decline, so it's quite a sad story. So I've circled the ones here um, that are the Section 41 or UK BAP species, but there are a number of others that are in decline, or we know very little about their status at the moment. So sadly, we've lost two UK bumblebees um, since the start of the 20th century. So the one here on the left, uh, the Cullen's <coughs> bumblebee, lost in 1941. And in 1988, we lost the short-haired bumblebee. So the short-haired bumblebee is the bumblebee I mentioned earlier that's subject to a reintroduction programme. So the Bumblebee Conservation Trust is running a project in Kent, in Dungeness, which is the last known site of the short-haired bumblebee. And they brought in new bumblebees. It's quite a long story, but they brought in some from New Zealand, and they brought in some from Sweden, um, and they're waiting to see whether that's been successful. But as part of this, what they've done is they've worked with landowners there, about 70 farmers, to make the habitat right. Because essentially the reason why it's, it won't extinct is because it needs 
really large areas of flower-rich habitat, which we didn't have anymore. So they've been working very hard with local people to um, create lots of nice flower-rich habitat. So the good news is that a lot of other rare species that were in the area are recovering and coming back in really high numbers. So we're waiting to see whether the short-haired bumblebee has become established. We've got lots of information on our website if you'd like to find out more about the project. So sadly, a bit more doom and gloom. So we've got two species that we consider to be on the brink of extinction. So this one here is the great yellow bumblebee, Bombus distinguendus, very distinguished bee. So it was previously found all across the UK. You can perhaps make out the yellow squares there, that shows its previous distribution up to 1999. And then now from 2000 to present, it's just up on the north coast of Scotland and some of the outer Scottish islands. So it's really retracted its range all the way up there. And it's just kind of clinging on. This bumblebee, the shrill kind of bumblebee, gets its name because of its high-pitched buzz. This one is also sadly on the brink of extinction. So previously, again, fairly widespread across the UK, but now it's restricted where you see these red patches. Oops, I keep doing that, sorry, I should learn. Um, along here, um, we can see that it's restricted to a few sites around South Wales. We've got some in Somerset, and there's another hotspot for it in the Thames Gateway area. And um, this bee is really struggling because it's a very poor disperser and it likes big areas of black flower-rich habitat, which again, we don't really have much flower-rich habitat in the amounts that it needs. And because it doesn't fly very far, only about 250 metres, then it means that it's very hard for it to move from one patch of flowers to another one if there's not a continuous amount in the landscape. So it's subject to inbreeding and all sorts of other problems because it can't move around. So this is one that we're really concerned about. So it was last seen in Devon in the 1970s, but that's not to say it's not here. Maybe it's because no one's been out looking for it. So again, another one to keep your eye out for. So the big question, why are so many pollinators declining? Why are we losing these bees? Why are they in decline? Well, it's down to a lot of different factors that are all interacting with each other. There's no one easy answer, but it's largely due to the loss of forage and nesting space. So it's nothing too complicated, really. They need something to eat and they need somewhere to live, and we're not giving them enough of those habitats. So these beautiful, flowery, rich meadows that used to dominate the landscape are now changing, and we've got more of a kind of green desert. So from the 1940s, there was um, excuse me, and there was a agricultural intensification basically. So after the war, when we didn't want to rely on the expensive imports, there wasn't the food available. People needed to make it at home. So there was the dig for victory campaign. People digging out their wildflowers, planting vegetables instead, and farmers forced to. Um, grow lots more food, um, there was the increased mechanisation, cheap fertilisers, cheap pesticides, um, so everything became more intensive. So we lost our flower-rich meadows in favour of fast-growing competitive grasses to feed our livestock with to, in, to meet that increasing demand. So other reasons for this decline, we've lost um, large areas so we've just got small patches and as I said it's very hard for pollinators to move between them so this habitat fragmentation is really impacting. There's an impact of pesticides, new diseases, urbanisation as our population's gotten bigger and bigger we're encroaching on these um, habitats for bumblebees and also climate change so if you think back to that map about the great yellow bumblebee that's all the way up to the north coast and um, that's an example of how climate change is affecting our bumblebees and other pollinators. So let's talk about the loss of meadows. So there's an estimated massive 98% loss of flower-rich grassland since the 1940s. So, I mean, that's, that's a, a huge amount to get your mind around, really. And as a result, we're losing our meadow bumblebees. So um, this is an example of four of our meadow specialists. Um, meadow bumblebees are often long-toned. They like the um, deep flowers that you commonly get in meadows. And also many of the um, meadow bumblebees are late emerging, so whereas some of them more common, they'll come out in early spring, some of these species won't come out of hibernation until kind of May onwards. So um, they don't have that advantage um, of some of the earlier bumblebees in terms of the forage available. They're really relying on some later flowering species which aren't so common in the landscape anymore. 
So meadows provide a diverse range of food, so this makes them really important for a lot of different pollinators, not just bumblebees, but if we think about bumblebee plants, red clover, yellow rattle, bird's foot truffle and red bartsia are all fantastic pollen sources, and napleats and scabiouses are some good examples of good nectar plants. So meadows are really great for mid and late season forage. So as I said, some of these rarer species come out quite late in the season and meadows are offering a fantastic amount of food at that time of year. And they also offer, offer nesting opportunities in the long grasses. So I'll come back to nesting and what that actually means. Um, and then if you think about what's around the meadow, so where you've got hedgerows, these are really fundamental habitats for so many of our wildlife, but they offer bumblebees in particular, nesting, forage, shelter and hibernation sites. So another problem that bees are facing um, is the effect of pesticides. So it's quite a, a big topic, I don't profess to be an expert on it by any means, and the effects of all these different pesticides, there's so many new coming out, the effects are still being researched. But we do know that some can reduce bees' ability to gather food, to navigate through the landscape, and they can slow colony growth and larval development. So I'm just going to talk briefly about neonicotinoids. So they're often treated, um, they often treat the plants as a seed treatment. So what that means is the um, pesticide travels up into the different tissues of the plant, and that includes the pollen and nectar. So what that means for bees and other pollinators is when they visit the plant to collect the pollen and nectar, then they are consuming the pesticide. And it is a bit of a mixed um, and controversial topic, pesticides, I have to say, but there is a growing body of evidence that there is a detrimental effect of neonicotinoids, and they have been banned, and we are in favour of that, um, because they do impact on non-target or organisms, not just the herbivores that they're intended to affect. So there's a, a huge range of different studies out there, but I've just taken this one here as an example, where they fed bumblebees the neonicotinoids, the amount that they would naturally find in, well, not naturally, sorry, that they'd find in the wild, and it, they did find them to affect their brain function and their, the colonies did perform poorly. So what we as a trust are in favour of is integrated pest management. So what that means is that you should try all other options first and then use pesticides as a last resort. So um, opt for the least environmentally damaging option first, um, but pesticides are an important part of the way we farm. If we want to be able to feed everybody, then we understand that pesticides need to be used, but with consideration and um, responsibility and as a last resort. So should we be worried about this decline of pollinators? Well, the short answer is yes, yes we should. So they've got a big commercial value. So they're estimated at 600 million per year in the UK. So that's not a small amount. They increase crop quality and quantity, and we know that wild plants depend on them, and there are all sorts of other organisms that then depend on those wild plants, so indirectly depending on pollinators. And they've got an intrinsic value, they're important in their own right, and we should be thinking about how we can look after them. And these pictures here just demonstrate just a, a few of the things that bumblebees and other pollinators are pollinating for us, so our crops, food, and... Um, <coughs> Excuse me, and clover pasture for livestock, so indirectly they're important for our, our meat industry as well. So this picture I felt really is just telling of, of what the situation is. So this is showing a gentleman in China, in the Sichuan province, pollinating apple trees. So he's got a feather duster on the end of that long stick. He's climbed up the tree to do the pollinating, and that's because there aren't the bees. So this is quite a, a sad story, and it's something that's maybe just around the corner for us if we don't do something about it. We'll be forced to pollinate our own crops. And I mean, it's just not possible to do the job of a bee and to pollinate all the wild plants. Who's gonna pay for someone to go and pollinate those? We really do rely on our wild pollinators. They're offering a free service, uh, as it were, and we need to be looking after them and not let this happen. So, now I've talked about the boom and gloom, what can we do to change this? How can we stop this from happening? So how are we going to turn that more into a, big, a nature reserve for bees? So to understand how we're going to do that, first of all, we need to think about what bees need. So their needs are quite simple, really. They need food, and by that I mean they need something from March all the way through to October. 
so they want something to last the whole season. So it's no good just having something in summer, we need something in the spring and late summer as well. And they also need a home, so they need somewhere to live, they need somewhere to nest, shelter and hibernate. So it's quite simple really, just food and a home. So to understand that a bit more, I'm just going to talk you through the bumblebee life cycle so you can get a bit of a clearer picture about what it is to be a bee. So this picture here shows um, a, a new queen that's just come out of hibernation. So she spent the winter and now she's come out in the spring and she needs to forage, build up her energy reserves and get ready to make her new colony. So around this time of year you may well have seen some really big fat bumblebees buzzing loudly and searching around in the vegetation and what she's doing is she's looking for somewhere to make her nest. So spring is a really critical time because if there isn't the amount of food that she needs then her nest is going to fail before it's even started. So she needs plenty of food to build up her fat reserves that have <coughs> run down and to be able to feed her colony. So things like willow, blackthorn, hawthorn, um, spring bulbs, these are all really important at this time of year. So what she does then is she lays her first batch of eggs and she'll sit on that and incubate it just like a bird would. So she keeps it nice and warm, shivers her muscles and um, generates a lots of heat and feeds her larvae with um, pollen and nectar. So at this stage, the colony is really quite vulnerable because the queen's doing everything. So she's raising her young, she's going out foraging. And so when she's out, she's leaving that nest very vulnerable to predators, which could be things like mice or, or well, there's a whole long list of things that will eat the bumblebee um, colony, given a chance, because there's so much rewarding food in there. So after a few weeks, then the first workers will emerge. And at this point, the queen will now stay in the nest and she'll just um, lay eggs from this point on um, and the workers will be the ones who go out foraging, collecting the pollen and nectar and bringing that back to the nest, doing the general sort of housework, the general house maintenance and defending the nest. So gradually the numbers will build up over time and if the nest is successful then the um, new um, generation of sexuals will be produced, so the males and the queens. So if I just go back a step here, so this shows you inside the nest. So you can see some um, baby bees um, looking nothing like the adult, as you can see, just very grub-like. And um, you can see some pots here that contain the um, nectar. So she'll gather the nectar and put it in a little honey pot. And there's clumps of pollen there as well that the bees are feeding on. Um, this shows you the um, inside of the nest. And um, here's a, a foraging bumblebee. You can see this very nice um, full pollen load on its leg. So if the, like I say, if the nest is successful, then it will produce males and queens. If it isn't, and many of them aren't, then that nest is a failure and there isn't a new generation that's produced for the next year. So you can, you can start to see here why it's so important that there's food throughout the whole season, because if it doesn't reach the stage of producing the new males and the queens, then that nest has failed. So once they have mated, the males will die and the queens will go off and um, build up their energy reserves because she's getting ready to hibernate. So where they decide to hibernate is generally somewhere nice and cool that's not going to be disturbed. So this here shows um, inside a flower pot actually. Um, you probably can't quite see but there's a little hibernating bumblebee in there. So they may choose um, north facing banks for example or under trees or at the bottom of hedgerows somewhere that they can dig down into the soil just a few inches and spend the winter. So once the spring comes, then the whole cycle starts again and this new queen will head off and make her nest. So in the UK, bumblebees are annual, so this just takes one year. So the workers will only live for a few weeks and um, the queen will live a maximum of that time um, of a year if um, she's successful. But having said that, because of climate change, we are seeing some changes. So the buff-tailed bumblebee is one of our common species, and it's now been seen to be active over the winter even, um, which is quite a change. So um, it just shows you just how things are, are changing. So as I said, they need pollen for protein and nectar for sugars, and they want a continuous supply of food. So um, I'm going to talk a bit more about that now um, and I'm going to ask you to think of it as being like a, offering a bumblebee a three-course meal. So you're offering them a starter, so that's your spring food, 
your main course, that's your midsummer, and your dessert, that's your late summer. And these are just some examples of nice bumblebee habitats, or in any pollinator habitat really. You've got um, orchards, um, a flower-rich nectar margin here on farmland, um, a woodland ride with lots of lovely bluebells there, and of course your meadow. So let's think about the early forage, the starter, the first course. So orchards are fantastic, you've got this big bl bloom of blossom at that time of year, um, offering an abundant food source. Hedgerows, great for things like blackthorn and hawthorn and willows. These are all really key species in the spring. And the hedge banks, which Devon is famous for, has got a huge diversity of different plants that benefit all sorts of pollinators. Um, things like red campion, ground ivy, there's a long list really. But they, these are all essential for giving bumblebees that, that um, early start to be able to establish their colony. So on to the mid course, the mid course, sorry, the main course in midsummer. This is where your meadows come in. So flower rich meadows and pastures are really key to supporting bumblebees at this time of year. So um, your typical meadow species like your clovers and your vetches, trefoils, um, knapweeds, um, some of the wild carrots, for example, these are all great at this time of year in the midsummer for supporting bumblebees. And then on to dessert, what do bumblebees like to eat for dessert? Well, in the late summer, um, things like scabiouses, knapweeds, thistles, um, and dead nettle, white dead nettle, brilliant plant all year round actually, um, not just in the late summer, also in the spring. And it's often considered to be a weedy species, you might find it on the you know, edge of your um, roads or paths or whatever, but it's a fantastic plant for bumblebees. I'm trying to grow it in my greenhouse to get it established in my garden, and I can't get it to grow. You find it everywhere else, it's so weedy, but um, it's a brilliant source of food for bumblebees. So, lake cut glass, grassland areas, edges, um, so like I was saying, edges of tracks and things, banks, ditches and hedgerows, these are all key in the late summer. And if you don't have all of these stages through the year, then you don't support that bumblebee colony and it won't be successful. You won't have it again the next year. So interestingly, what um, flowers you have will decide what bumblebees will come and visit. And this is all due to their length of tongue. So if you kind of think of it like a straw, then if you've got a deep flower and a long tongue, then that's what you will go for because that's the easiest plant for you to handle. So this one here, this is the garden bumblebee, one of our longest tongue bumblebees. Look how enormous that is. And um, she's going into this viper's bee gloss flower here. Whereas this bumblebee here, very short tongue, as you can see here, especially compared to this long tongue species, and it's going for quite a shallow open flower, like one of the umbels, say like a cow parsley or anything like that. She'll be going for something that's much easier with her short tongue. So if you try and think about what you've got in your gardens or your meadows, the more diverse the flower, the shape and the size, the more diverse um, the bees are that you'll be supporting. But having said that, some of them are quite sneaky. So nectar robbing, this little cheeky chap is... Um, has cut a hole in the bottom of this honeysuckle flower and it's um, stuck its tongue in to sneakily get the nectar without going in the legitimate <laughs> way that the flower wants it to, to get it pollinated. So it's um, robbing the nectar. So even if you've only got long, um, deep flowers, then they'll find a way around it. So that's the food. We know what they want to eat. So what about where they want to live? So many bumblebees um, have an association with small mammals. So I, I googled um, small mammals to get a nice picture, and that was very cute. But sadly, it's from Ventakills. Um, <laughs> <the other side. laughs> I thought that's so sweet. How cute! Anyway, I'll get into that. Um, so many of them choose to nest in small mammal burrows, things like mice, trees, and voles. And um, so you need long, tusky grassland for those small mammals to live in, because once they've um, um, finished with their burrow and their runs, then the bumblebees will move in. So what we need is for these to be in warm, sunny, undisturbed places um, from February through till September, October, because that's allowing that bumblebee the time to finish its colony from when it emerges in the spring, in February, March, to when the colonies are finished in September, October. I should have said back at that life cycle stage, really, that there's um, differences in the time of year that different species come out and when their colony is finished. So some of the earlier ones are February, March, they'll come out, and some of the later ones 
will finish in around September or October, but others finish well before that, so there's a continuum really. But the main take home is really to leave these areas as undisturbed as you can, for as long as you can. So these glamorous locations are where a bumblebee, like, bumblebee might like to live. So this one on the left here, this scrubby patch of brambles and long grasses, um, this Although it doesn't look much and people think that looks really messy, let's tidy it up. And I actually, maybe I shouldn't confess this, but I had to hide um, half the picture behind that one because there's somebody clearing the scrub. Um, <laughs> but this is a great place for bumblebees to nest because they, they like this long grass and this undisturbed patch. Um, and then here's another example. There's um, a grass margin against um, an arable field here. Um, and it's become long and tussocky. Um, so not only is it supporting bumblebees, but it's also allowing an overwintering site for all sorts of other insects as well by leaving that to grow nice and long. So um, some bumblebees will nest underground. So the buff tail bumblebee, Bombus terrestris, gets its name from that, likes to nest in the underground burrows. Other ones prefer to nest on the surface of the ground, so in, in grassy tussocks like the common card bee. Um, so it wants the top of its nest to get nice and warm in the grass, but it'll um, yeah, nest, nest on the top of the ground. Um, other bumblebees will kind of take advantage of where they can. So bird boxes are quite commonly used by the tree bumblebee um, up here. Um, so it's got this nice gingery back and a white tail. And then we've got this red tail bumblebee, which has got this red tail here and the rest of it's black. So they're quite distinct to bees, um, but certainly not birds. They like nesting in bird boxes under eaves or even under stones and logs they're going to get nice and warm in the sun. So other aspects of their home life that we need to think about is where they want to hibernate. So as I said earlier they want to choose somewhere that's nice and cold. They need a slightly different environment for where they choose to make their nest. So they'd like to nest in, sorry, they like to hibernate north facing banks, under trees, in leaf litter, or hedgerow bases, and this picture here shows a buff-tailed bumblebee digging into the ground, and she, so she's digging into this loose soil, and she'll go down just a few inches and spend the winter hibernating there. So, now we know what bees need, they need food at home, what can you do to help? So if you've got a garden, then there are all sorts of different things you can do. So when you're thinking about what food you can give your bumblebees, then think about a mixture. So the more diverse your flowers, the more diverse the bumblebees. So think about the colours and the shapes and the flowering times, crucially. So here I've got a few examples um, of a nice open flower, this geranium here. Um, and this one here is a nice shallow flower, one of the sedums. Then we've got knapweed that's attracting some of the longer tongue species, flowering a bit later. And my old favourite, white dead nettle, which is good all year round. So if you're after some ideas, then we've got um, some great leaflets at the back. There's um, a free gardening for bumblebees leaflet and um, a more chunkier one that's for three pounds if you want to learn a bit more. But one thing to note really is if you want to put food for bumblebees or other pollinators is to avoid things like this, these double flowered varieties. So if you can kind of put, put yourself in the mind of a bee, I mean, trying to find your way through all these nice pretty petals it's, it's very tricky, whereas if you look at this lovely open geranium, it's really easy for the bee to get to the nectar there. So these ones, although they look very pretty, then they're not much good for pollinators. So what else could you do? You could create a mini meadow. So really, it's just letting your imagination take you and decide what you want to do. So you could have a patch of your lawn convert it to a meadow, or you could even use a container and make a mini meadow, a very mini mini meadow. So a lot of the off-the-shelf mixes, um, I'm doing a sales pitch here, but we've got a mix at the back if you'd like to buy them for £2. Um, they contain a really good variety that will do well in gardens in these kind of fertile environments. So things like oxeye daisies, poppies and cornflowers, and they provide a riot of colour as you can see from that picture there. So if you wanted to convert a patch of your lawn, then I'd advise you to remove the turf because you want to get rid of those competitive grasses that will outcompete the wildflowers. And if you want to have a more long established um, meadow with some of the more sensitive species that like lower fertility, I'd advise you to take the topsoil off and add in a bit of sand to reduce that fertility. Or you could choose a mix that tolerates fertile soils like this one up here and they're the more kind of standard mixes with the poppies and cornflowers and so on. 
So to manage your meadow, if you cut it and remove the clippings in September, then that will really benefit. So you want to remove the clippings because you want to keep the fertility as low as you can. But by leaving the clippings there a few days, you allow the seeds to drop out and you'll get the plants back again the next year. But by leaving it until September, you're allowing bumblebees to finish using those flowers and finish any nesting that was going on in there as well. You're not going to disturb that. So if you'd like to know a bit more about how bee friendly your garden is, we've got a bee kind tool on our website. So you can plug in what species you've got and it will tell you how good they are for bumblebees. And based on what you've got already, then there'll be a, a series of suggestions of other plants you might like to consider. And you can also um, upload it to be included in our map. So we're trying to see how bee friendly um, people's gardens are around the UK. So do get involved if you can. So essentially, the take home message is avoid this green desert. So um, this is a lovely um, fake grass lawn. Um, I can't really see any flowers in there. So the opposite of that. So we've talked about food. What about nesting? Well, it's the messy areas, the things that people think of as messy, where your neighbour peeping over the, the fence might think, oh, I haven't bothered this year. Well, actually, these are brilliant for bumblebees. Mm -hmm. So we want long grass. You can say, I'm not being lazy, relaxing here in the hammock, but I'm making bumblebee habitat. So we've got long grass, bramble, grass clippings. These are all great potential nesting places for bumblebees. So you might want to go a step further and attract some solitary bees and wasps to some bee hotels or even bee mansions. So bumblebees won't use fake, um, sorry, the artificial nests unless they smell of mouse wee. We know that they like old mouse nests. And when they're prospecting around at this time of year, they're actually picking up the smell of mouse urine. So unless you somehow manage to do that on your um, bee hotels, you won't get any bumblebees. But you will get solitary bees. So here are some examples. I don't know if you can quite see them really. But this one is a particular favourite, Buggingham Palace it's called, with these nice um, flags here. Um, they've used some old pallets and they've um, filled it with things like old flower pots that are stuffed with sticks of different diameters. And these will um, attract solitary bees and nests into. Um, you can put old bricks in, um, um, logs with um, holes drilled in of different sizes. And John Walters, who's here this evening, has brought some examples um, back at the um, back of the room there. There's um, some that he's brought along to give you some ideas. So just so you know what's happening in there, this is a cross section of one of these sticks. So in here, you've got a ball of pollen and nectar that the solitary bee has put in there. And she's laid her egg that's turned into a larva that's feeding on there. And she'll put it in this little chamber and... Um, put either a, um, a mud plug or a, a leaf plug between each one, so all in their individual little cells. So unlike the bumblebee that raise the larvae into adulthood, then the solitary bees put the food down and lay the egg and then leave them to it. So if you're inspired to get involved, there's a competition actually. So uh, get Devon buzzing. Um, we've got, um, if you have a look on Natural Devon, um, you can enter into their competition and there's even a chance to win a year's membership to the Longby Conservation Trust, as if you needed any more reason. <laughs> so what else can you do for nesting? So here is my garden with lots of bumblebee habitat. Um, so this is a, um, a small mound of soil. So here is my pond and we put the excavated soil in a pile at the side. And um, this has attracted all sorts of ground nesting bees. So this is a south-facing bank. It's not very high. It's maybe, well, it's less than half a metre high. And um, it just gets nice and warm. It's clear of grasses. And the solitary bees will come and make their nests in there. And I can sit and watch them. It's, um, yeah, wonderful to see. So this shows you a cross-section of what that, that nest looks like. So the bees make this nice long burrow. And there are branches off in which she'll put her little ball of pollen and lay her egg. So um, she's got this entrance and lots of little chambers coming off. And here's a little bee popping out of the top burrow there. And that so many of these bees will commonly nest in gardens and it's a great opportunity to observe them because they're quite happy to go about their business and you can just sit and watch. So what if you've only got a small space? Well, you could create a bee cafe or a bee drive through or a fly through, I should say. So this, I think, is pretty magnificent. These um, hanging baskets, um, window boxes. You don't need a lot of space to be able to do something positive for bees. 
So um, again, let your imagination go. You could use a wildflower mix of annuals, you could have herbs, and if you've got space for pots, um, you could, herbs are always a great one, um, but if you leave them long enough to flower. And even things like tomatoes or other fruits, um, they're fantastic sources of food for bumblebees. So there's no excuse, everybody can do something. So what about if you've got a bit more space, if you've got a meadow? So as we know, bum uh, bumblebee flowers um, in meadows are a really important source of food. So if you are converting a, a pasture, then um, I'd advise you to join the Wall Meadows group. There's lots of help available. And um, a crucial thing is to think about choosing locally sourced seeds. So these seeds are going to do better because they're more adapted to the local conditions. And you're also not um, introducing new varieties, new strains that um, might outcompete native species. So I'm just going to talk really quickly about meadow management and how that can benefit bumblebees. So obviously there's lots of ways to manage your meadow, but if you want to encourage bumblebees and encourage those flowers, then we want to have a low fertility because that encourages the wildflowers over the competitive grasses, which like the high nutrients. So if you think about your um, sort of typical, um, so let's say a dairy cow field where it's a lot of um, bright green grass and not much else, that's because they like these really high fertile conditions. So there's been um, lots of fertilizer spread, produces lots of food for the cows, in a wildflower meadow, then it, we want the opposite because we want to encourage those wildflowers which like the low nutrients and suppress those competitive grasses that like the high nutrients. So cutting and grazing is important. So although you wouldn't necessarily think immediately that grazing and cutting is good for flowering, actually it's an important part because it stops those competitive grasses from taking over. So we need to have that regular cutting and removing those clippings to keep that, those nutrients down. But the key thing is about when you graze or when you cut, and I'll come to that in a moment. So we'd recommend avoid chemical fertilisers, minimum use of manure, um, again, to encourage the wildflowers over those competitive grasses. So flowering is really key because we want to give food for the bumblebees. So ideally, um, light or rotation or even no summer grazing, um, because you're allowing those flowers the opportunity to flower, and then perhaps consider a rotational rate cut. So, for example, in September, if you can leave, um, if you've got more than one field, if you can leave a field a bit later, or even a strip between within a field, this provides late forage, which is really crucial, but also it maintains the diversity because it allows later flowering species that opportunity to flower and set seed. And we know that some bumblebees um, continue their nest up until September, October. So by leaving it later, you're allowing those later nesters that opportunity to finish what they're doing. So importantly, we need to all work together because habitat connectivity is really fundamental as to whether these bees can survive. So some of these rarer bees that we were talking about need really big areas of flower-rich habitat and to be able to achieve that, we all need to be working together. By providing stepping stones and corridors through the landscape, we can all contribute to that. It's important for pollinators to be able to move around the landscape because they need to disperse to find food, but also to find mates because they get inbred if they can only stay in one patch. So we really need to be thinking all together as a whole. So hedgerows are a really important way that pollinators can move through the landscape. So we can think of them as bee highways. So as we know, they provide food, shelter, hibernation and nesting sites. And they also allow bees to navigate through the landscape using the landmarks to, because um, we know from research that bees will follow the edge of hedge, hedges to um, move through the landscape. So what kind of management should we be thinking about if we have hedgerows? Well, try and avoid something like this really, bits of the air. So by cutting more infrequently, so no more than one year and two, one year and three, or even less frequently if you've got hedges of slow growing species, means that you get more flowers and also more fruits that benefit birds and a whole host of other wildlife. By having a continuous hedgerow, it allows those bees to navigate through and to move through. So by gapping up with native species, you're also providing more food. And um, it's also recommended that you cut incrementally rather than back to the same point each time. It's been found through research that you get more flowering that way and, it's, and you get the thicker, denser hedgerow. So how else can you help? So I'm going to do another plug. You could join the Bumblebee Conservation Trust. 
So your support really does make a difference and it funds our projects and allows us to be on the ground and do this work. There are lots of other ways you can help us. So by becoming a volunteer for the Trust, um, people who are interested in understanding a bit more about how to identify bumblebees and maybe you want to know what's on your patch and monitor them year on year, you can get involved in our national monitoring scheme. So by walking a set route once a month, so it's not a big commitment, once a month from March through to October, then you um, record all the bumblebees that you see on your walk and you send that to us. And then year on year, we can see how bumblebees are changing. Because some of the species that we think of as being common, they may well not be, but we just don't have that information. So by contributing to this, we can understand what the picture is and target our conservation efforts. Um, we also need some help with people at events, fundraising, whatever you like. We don't have a large number of active volunteers um, in Devon. We have a few bee walkers, which is brilliant. But to stop poor Stephen, wherever Stephen is hiding, and uh, being dragged to all these events, then if someone else would like to get involved and help out as well, then that would be really appreciated. So I just wanted to end on my project, just to tell you a bit about West Country Does. So I've got some leaflets at the back there, please do help yourself. So my project is to work with landowners, and I'm trying to support pollinator-friendly land management. So this is through a variety of ways, so one-to-one -one land management, going out and about on farms, around the southwest and working with farmers to see how they can tweak their management to think about pollinators as well. So can they change their grazing or their um, cutting and can they leave a, a patch that's a bit messy and all these kinds of things. Working with them on an individual basis so we can really tailor it to work with them because farms are businesses, they need to earn money and we need to be able to work pollinators into a part of that where it's not a burden but it's something that they can do. So I'm also working to raise awareness of pollinator needs and also trying to get more people out and about recording bumblebees in Devon because there's really um, a large number of areas that we just don't have that data for. So what, as part of this, then we're working on a bumblebee atlas to Devon. So this year, if you can get any of your records in, then they'll make it into our atlas that's coming out next year. And we can then review what we know about bees in Devon and try and think about how we're going to target our conservation efforts. So there's lots to do to get involved if you'd like to. And then please do come and talk to me if you're interested in any land um, management advice. So you can keep up to date with our project on our website and on Twitter. So I recently joined Twitter. If I'm new to it, don't really understand what I'm doing. But please do follow me if you are on Twitter. And just to say thank you very much for listening.